Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's probably heretical in this crowd, but I'm actually not going to use slides. Uh, maybe it's a function that I've been in government too long and putting things in writing uh, uh, often uh, can, can be used against you. Um, but, but let me just start out with a kind of couple just overall contextual comments here. And, um, you know, prior to my time at the federal level, I also worked at the uh, I was also the state director for addiction services in Massachusetts for nine years. So I've been working uh, this issue for a very, very long time, both at the state and the national level. And I also think it's important to acknowledge, since patient experience is so important and critical part of this conversation, that I'm also a person in long-term recovery from uh, substance use disorder. So I've seen this, and I know that I'm an N of one uh, in this crowd, but also I've seen kind of uh, th that issue also from a patient perspective with a substance use disorder. And uh, probably to the satisfaction of none, uh, you know, I've straddled this world between science and politics for a very long time. And, um, you know, sometimes the, when it works best, we implement programs with uh, rigorous scientific evidence. Sometimes the best that we can do is actually mitigate the harm uh, uh, from our political world in terms of really bad pieces of legislation. So we have kind of a, a, a dual function here. Um, so I think that's kind of just important to start. Uh, the other thing that I think is interesting, having kind of been doing this work for a long time, and, you know, Massachusetts was a state uh, that has been hit hard and actually hit early with this epidemic. Uh, New England has always had more significant heroin use rates than the rest of the country, which is why I think we uh, saw some significant issues. So I've been dealing with this for a while. And, you know, but but this was, in essence, somewhat of a novel drug epidemic, as we see here, in terms of largely coming from legally prescribed medications and required kind of a suite of responses to this without a lot of evidence base behind them. Um, but the challenge as a policymaker and as a practitioner is, you know, you can't sit and do nothing while you wait for the accumulation of evidence uh, in terms of what you do. So what you try to do is look at what are the causes, what does the data and evidence say that is causing this, and then try to implement programs uh, against those. Um, and, and I will have to say, as a federal person, probably one of the most frustrating areas, and I'm looking at Keith Humphrey here, who could probably identify with me, is that you're often reacting to two-year-old data. Uh, and it doesn't give you tremendous um, uh, kind of real-time insight, both in terms of the efficacy of your approaches or perhaps even unintended consequences to your approaches. And I, I think that we've seen the CDC has gotten better in terms of accelerated data, um, but it's really challenging when you're, uh, when you're reacting to kind of two-year-old data in terms of trying to uh, uh, understand what's effective, what's not effective, and what's unintended. So, you know, particularly at the state level, I think their area number one, was enhanced information and data reporting, and I think that we've seen that. So, uh, so I want to just spend a couple minutes talking about the crux of the federal response here and then end with a couple of kind of questions about unintended consequences. And, and while not specifically um, uh, uh, around the opioid epidemic, I don't think I can start a federal response with talking about the role of the Affordable Care Act and particularly Medicaid expansion as a response to the opioid epidemic. And I think you know that the affordable, one of the reasons that, main reasons that people don't get treatment is the fact that they didn't have insurance coverage uh, here. And I think that, um, you know, clearly the Affordable Care Act, by having substance use disorder treatment as one of the 10 essential benefits, uh, was um, uh, actually revolutionary in terms of people getting treatment. And many of us know Richard Frank and Sherry Glyde, who did a lot of analysis in terms of looking at this and showed, particularly in hard-hit states like West Virginia, Kentucky, we saw significant increases to treatment and particularly medication-assisted treatment in those states. I think many of us were jumping up and down by the New York Times article that we saw uh, the other day from Dayton, Ohio, that showed a reduction where the mayor of Dayton basically attributed Medicaid expansion to one of the most significant reasons why uh, uh, Dayton, Ohio, has been seeing a 50% reduction in overdose deaths. And I'll talk a little bit about unintended consequences in that. Uh, in 2011, prior to my arrival at ONDCP, the administration released its prescription drug abuse prevention plan called prescription drug abuse at the time, because that's what the vast majority of those issues are. And it was really focused on four pillars. One, on education, not only for the public around uh, 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 prevention-related issues, but particularly for prescribers on safer uh, opioid prescribing. And I can tell you, you know, what we tried to promote was always a balanced view around, uh, we didn't talk about re uh, reducing opioid prescribing, but also talked about a balance, that people who were in pain actually needed uh, and deserved appropriate access 
access to pain medication. And that included on the uh, international arena as well, where one of our treaty obligations uh, as it relates to the UN actually requires us to make sure that people have adequate access to pain control. So I don't know what's happening now, but that was clearly an important role for us to make sure that we uh, 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 relied upon. The second was on monitoring and prescription drug monitoring programs. Uh, you know, as you saw data when, uh, uh, when the administration started, uh, uh, we had very few states that had prescription uh, drug monitoring programs, uh, very few states where the data was linked to electronic medical records, that still happens, and very few states that were sharing data across state lines. Uh, the next was on disposal. I think all of us know that the most significant uh, source for prescription drug misuse actually comes from diverted legitimate prescriptions. So disposal uh, was an uh, important priority. And lastly was enforcement. And uh, Jane's, uh, uh, and this was largely centered around Florida and some of the pill mills that we saw, saw some disturbing data uh, early on that actually Broward County in the area around Fort Lauderdale at one point accounted for 50% of the opioid prescribing in the United States. United States, uh, largely as it related to these uh, uh, pill mills. Um, but, you know, part of my uh, particular uh, interest uh, was really about the expansion of medication-assisted treatment. That was a really important priority for us. And the administration, in concert with Congress, took a number of significant actions. One was to raise the patient cap uh, for uh, uh, buprenorphine from 100 to 275. Although I do have to say, I think um, uh, that is uh, um, uh, not sufficient uh, to really um, uh, get at what we understand to be uh, the treatment deserts that we have in the United States in terms of lack of prescribers. Because I actually don't think it's a cap issue because most prescribers who are prescribing aren't prescribing anywhere near the cap. It's not really the issue. Uh, however, uh, that said, uh, uh, that was one issue. But also working with Congress to allow nurse practitioners and physicians assistants to be able to prescribe buprenorphine. We actually worked with my friend Patrice Harris, who you're going to hear from, uh, and with the AMA to uh, increase the number of physicians in the United States. I think it merits discussion in this room that uh, nearly 16 years uh, after we had approved buprenorphine, we only have 4% of primary care providers in this country who have even gone through the waiver process. Probably only 50% of them actually treat uh, people, and of those are only treating a small majority. So, so in, uh, I, I think we've got to, to challenge each other as practitioners, and I'm not a doc, so I can say this, um, uh, you know, we need to do a better job, and I think you saw it now, of really promoting more widespread uh, uh, um, treatment for, for people with addiction. It, it's got to be part of our strategy. But in that, in that vein, we worked with SAMHSA and the Centers for Disease Control to expand medication-assisted treatment, uh, and it was particularly focused on uh, uh, resources to community health centers across the country to try to promote more rural access and more integration with primary care. Um, the, one of the other areas that we uh, uh, actually mandated federal drug courts and now uh, addiction treatment programs who are receiving cures money passed by President Obama, not by President Trump, um, uh, um, to actually mandate that addiction treatment providers and drug courts offer access to medication-assisted treatment if they're receiving federal dollars. Uh, we clearly exploded... Uh, 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 promoted the expansion of naloxone distribution and Good Samaritan laws across the country. Uh, well, I was the director in Massachusetts when we trained the first police department in the country, as well as the first family, uh, first learn to cope uh, program. So it's really important to do that. And that was primarily based on research done by our, our friend and colleague, Dr. Alex Wally uh, at BMC, that showed that uh, naloxone distribution in the community reduced overdose deaths, and it had a saturation effect so that the more naloxone you got into the community, uh, the more um, uh, uh, we could reduce death. Uh, I, I think it's also worth noting um, that one of the areas, uh, surprisingly, that we were able to work successfully with a pretty conservative congressional delegation is we actually got them to repeal the decades-old ban on using federal funding for the uh, use of sterile syringe programs. Um, it still boggles my mind that it happens, uh, but largely in a response to what we've seen is not uh, not only an uh, opioid use disorder epidemic, but obviously hepatitis C, uh, uh, and as we've seen kind of uh, uh, significant outbreaks of HIV uh, in Scott County, Indiana. We just had one in Lowell and Lawrence, Massachusetts, and, and we know that many of our communities 
largely through the CDC vulnerability study, uh, are, are really uh, vulnerable to more significant outbreaks of HIV after, um, uh, um, after decades of progress. Uh, the other area that uh, I want to talk about is that we really, I think, try to foster public health and public safety collaborative efforts, largely through our high-intensity drug trafficking areas of making sure that public health and public safety were, were uh, working hand-in-hand -hand for better data and information sharing uh, and trying to work together for uh, overall approaches. And we've been talking about the CDC uh, prescriber guidelines, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. So, so I wanted to spend the last couple of minutes talking about kind of unintended consequences with a question mark. And, and I have to start with one because um, I, yeah, I, I think what we've been hearing in Congress over the years, particularly my, by more conservative quarters, that Medicaid expansion actually caused the opioid epidemic, right? So you have more people covered, they got more prescriptions, and so it's actually Medicaid expansion and the Affordable Care Act that created uh, uh, this epidemic. And so I cite an American Journal of Public Health article in March 2018 by Sharp and her colleagues that uh, said no. Uh, that um, I, I just want to make sure that we have a good baseline of information here, that there was actually no difference in prescribing patterns pre and post uh, Medicaid expansion, but uh, quite, uh, um, I think, optimistically showed that significant increases for medication, particularly buprenorphine and naltrexone. Uh, uh, as related to that. The, the other piece that I continue to hear that I think is important uh, to understand was, you know, did our focus on reducing opioid prescribing actually create the heroin and fentanyl issue? Um, and so I point to a New England Journal of Medical article by my then colleagues Wilson Compton, Chris Jones, and Grant Baldwin that they did a study of the literature and showed that while there might be individual cases, that was not a population level phenomenon. And I think we saw data today and we clearly saw this in Massachusetts where we saw this significant transition to heroin use and heroin overdoses uh, prior to any sort of reduction in uh, opioid prescribing and that that was probably much more of a function of the progressive nature of the disease and the fact that it's quite honestly uh, less expensive to buy heroin on the street than it is to buy your prescription pain medication for the street. And the last, and I think that's what we're talking about here, is that did the CDC guideline uh, um, uh, have unintended consequences in reducing access to opioid prescribe, and I think we're hearing quite clearly that it has been, and I, you know, uh, one of the panelists said today, which I think is really important, that, that uh, um, uh, you know, for, for this government to really to do a more significant evaluation in terms of what that looks like, uh, my colleague Dan Alford, who you'll be hearing from, uh, convinced me to, uh, and I think appropriately so, to, to uh, sign on to a letter going to the CDC to say that we should be uh, evaluating those protocols, which I think is important. The last thing that I'll say here, and then uh, it looks like I'm getting close to time, we've been talking a lot about methadone regulations, which I think is really important here. And I just want to say that uh, uh, very interesting. So uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Jeffrey Samet, who many of you know, myself and the Commissioner of Public Health in Massachusetts actually uh, uh, did a New England Journal of Medicine uh, letter calling for Congress to revise the 50-year-old uh, methadone regulations to allow for more integration in primary care. I will tell you, uh, to um, kind of my surprise, I shouldn't. I guess I shouldn't be surprised, uh, particularly as we see private equity moving into the methadone uh, market, uh, got significant pushback from the industry in terms of those regulations, as well as a very curt response from the now SAMHSA administrator refusing to even think about it. So, uh, and it for me, it was actually very reminiscent of my time in Massachusetts when I started started funding uh, community health centers to do buprenorphine treatment, and I heard the same call from our addiction treatment programs saying, they don't have the expertise to do it, they can't do it, why are you spending money uh, outside the specialty treatment system? Uh, and, and I think we're hearing some of that same refrain. So, you know, I, if there's one kind of takeaway uh, uh, among many, uh, I think that we need to, to really think about uh, regulatory reform for our methadone treatment programs. It's high time. Uh, it's, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Jennifer um, showed, Jessica showed, uh, and um, uh, Jane showed pictures of 
uh, methadone treatment programs. And, you know, having been doing this work for a long time, but also as a person with lived experience from this, you know, we shouldn't have to receive care, you know, in the worst part of town. We shouldn't have to go day after day after day after day for six months uh, to be deemed compliant uh, with treatment. And we've seen with buprenorphine and now in the tre uh, trexone, as well as work in other countries, that we can do this in the context of primary care. So if we think about work ahead, I think it's, uh, you know, it's high time and what should be high on the list is thinking about uh, reform of methadone regulations to allow for more significant integration. So thank you.